الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله أما بعد. So in our last حلقة uh, we had talked about the beginning of the revelation. We had talked about Jibril coming down and squeezing the Prophet and reciting to him. Iqra uh, bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq and the fact that when when the Prophet ﷺ came back to his wife Khadija, Khadija took him to Waraqa ibn Nawfal and we were still talking a little bit about uh, Waraqa and what happened after that. Uh, in this narration, the question arises, how could the Prophet ﷺ as a prophet, go to somebody who's not a prophet, here for example Waraqa, and get knowledge from him? This doesn't initially make sense. How could a prophet go to a non-prophet and ask this non-prophet, what's happening to me? Why is this happening? And in response, the scholars say, because at this point in time, he didn't recognize even that he was a prophet. He didn't understand what's happening to him. And this shows us that knowledge is so sacred and so important that even prophets have no problem learning from non-prophets. Because the one who knows is more knowledgeable than the one who doesn't. And therefore, even our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi even though he was a prophet, but he doesn't even recognize it now, so he goes to somebody who recognizes what is prophecy. And again, we need to realize, the concept of a prophet was unknown to the Arabs. It was unknown. They had long forgotten how was Ibrahim inspired and what was Ismail's message. They just knew it was Tawheed. They didn't have the concept of prophets, just like Hinduism or other religions of our time. They don't have the concept of a human being communicating with Allah. And therefore, when he didn't understand, he went to, who did he go to? Waraqa. And Waraqa is coming from a tradition, there are plenty of prophets. Right? Waraqa was a convert. We said to something that is, it's neither Judaism nor Christianity, let's call it Judeo-Christianity, right? It's his own understanding. So Waraqa understood what is a prophet. And therefore, when the Prophet ﷺ comes to him, immediately he recognizes, this is prophecy. And what you've seen is the angel that communicates with all of the prophets, and it communicates with Musa ﷺ. And of course, he mentioned Musa, because there's more of a similarity with Musa than with Isa, right? There's more of a similarity with Musa alayhi salam than there is with Isa alayhi salam. Now in that uh, riwayah, in that uh, uh, hadith, Khadija says, uh, or Aisha is the one narrating uh, what happened. Khadija uh, tells us the story of Waraqa, and Aisha then narrates from uh, indirectly from Khadija that because again Aisha never met Khadija, her conduit is the Prophet ﷺ telling as well uh, that. Shortly after this, Waraqa passed away. Waraqa died. I looked up as many books as I could in the classic references. I could not find any stories about Waraqa other than this, after his Islam. So uh, we only have one tradition from the Prophet ﷺ when he was asked about Waraqa ibn Nawfal and he said, I saw him in Jannah uh, wearing beautiful garments, uh, blessed with beautiful garments. Therefore, this shows that Waraqa was the first convert to Islam and Waraqa was the first Sahabi, and Waraqa was the first person who died of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, and therefore Waraqa uh, has entered Jannah, and he is of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. Returning to the hadith that we talked about, the long hadith of the first revelation, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah continues the story, and he mentions that after this time, the Prophet ﷺ stopped getting any revelation. Fatar al-Wahi. The revelation stopped. Ibn Abbas says that for many days the Prophet ﷺ would wander around Mecca and the valleys of Mecca and the mountains of Mecca wanting to see Jibreel again. But Jibreel would not appear. Some scholars even said this period lasted two or three years, but this is way too much. There's a riwayah from Ibn Abbas, he said 40 days. And another famous Sahabi, uh, Tabi'i, Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, uh, said that this period lasted for many days, so 40 days, many days, that for around a month after, so this is the month of Shawwal, because uh, it was in Ramadan when the revelation began, for an entire month and 10 days, the Prophet is confused, I saw something, but I don't see him again. What is going on wrong with me? And this is when he says, in the, in the, in the narration, he says, I was worried for myself, meaning, he, he thought that he might be going hallucinating. Something's going mad with him. He doesn't understand what's happening. And he would go to the uh, mountain of Hira, expecting to see Jibreel again. But every day he would go, and there's nothing there. Until finally one day, after we said around 40 days or so, uh, 
one day the Prophet ﷺ was coming down the mountain. And he had come down and he heard his name being called. So he says, I looked in front and I couldn't see anybody. He heard the name again, he looked behind him, there was nobody. He looked again and he looked again and he couldn't find but the name is being called. Now when somebody calls your name, you really don't think of looking straight up in the air. It's just not in our fitrah to do that. So when he's looking everywhere and he doesn't see it, then he said, I looked up and there was the angel that I had seen at Hira. There was the angel, he sees now Jibreel again, I had seen at Hira on a, on a kursi, on a throne between the heavens and the earth. And then he said, I began to tremble out of fear. Now subhanAllah, he's wanting to see Jibreel. But when he sees him, it's simply too much for him. And he begins to tremble. And in one, re in one report, he fell down on his knees out of shock and out of fear. He fell down on his knees. And then he got up again and out of fear, out of panic, once again he begins to rush home. And this is when he runs home to Khadija and he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. This is the time he says this again, cover me up. And again, this is something many of us have not experienced fear of this nature. May Allah protect us. But when you are so much afflicted with fear, you literally begin to feel cold. You begin to tremble, right? That type of fear. So he's feeling this fear. After all, he's seen the angel Jibreel in his original form. He's seen a huge beast or creature, if you like, of Allah, uh, you know, in between the heavens and the earth. And therefore he begins to tremble. So he runs back to Khadija. He says, Zambiluni, Zambiluni. And this was when the second revelation uh, was revealed. Revealed, and these were the first six or seven verses of Ya ayyuhal muzzammil qum al layla illa Sorry, Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'anthir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir wa thiyabaka fa'tahir wa rujza fahjur wa la tamnun tastakthir wa li rabbika fasbir These seven verses, the Surah Muddathir, they were revealed and therefore this is the second revelation of the Quran, the seven verses of Surah Al-Muddathir. Now, here, what is the wisdom of uh, these 30, 40 days that the Prophet ﷺ was not inspired? So, scholars say that this was to prepare him for the second meeting, to make him recover, to recollect his energies, to make him feel enthused, because now look at what's happening. He's coming every day to try to meet Jibreel. And despite this preparation, when he sees him, he becomes terrified. Imagine if it had come immediately, he would have been even more terrified. So this was to prepare him to calm his nerves down. Despite that, he still reacted the way that he did. And all of this shows us over and over again the humanity of our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It shows us that he didn't pre-plan this. This is not the, the thing that a, uh, a fraud, a charlatan, uh, 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 a two-faced liar billah, would do. If somebody wanted to invent a grandiose story... And there are people who claim to be prophets, even here in America there's a person, and in, uh, there used to be a person 100 years ago who claimed to be a prophet, and uh, in, in India there was a person who claimed to be a prophet 100 years ago. If you look at their stories, the stories that they invent are all grandiose. They're all, this happened and that happened and I did this. They put themselves to be the hero. Right? If you look at the story of the Prophet you find a human reaction. A reaction that could not be except from a sincere person. That he wasn't expecting this, he didn't want it. When it happens, he's terrified. And he goes to his wife and he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. And what is this revelation, what is the relevance of these verses? Ya ayyuhal muddathir. Notice as well, by the way, that from the context, a lot of people think that the revelation occurred when he saw Jibreel. No, the revelation occurred in the house of Khadija. When the Prophet ﷺ went back, this means Jibreel must have followed him. And when he's covered up with the cloak, with the garment, in the house of Khadija, Jibreel inspires him, and Jibreel speaks to him, and Jibreel says, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, O you who is wrapped up in a garment, O you who has the shawl around you, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, and the symbolism here, O you who are living in comfort, because when you're in a shawl, you're in comfort, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, you're so comfortable here, stop this life of ease, Qum, stand up, you were sitting down, you were easy, now you need to be active, Get rid of this cloak. Stand up. Qum. So there's an element here of you need to do something. You need to be proactive. You need to go out. You need to leave the sheltered life that you are living. You need to leave that, that, that uh, 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 if you like, warmth of the blanket. Get rid of this. You know, the safety blanket. Even children have it. The safety blanket. You feel comfortable. And Allah says, no. Qum fa'andir. Stand up. Get rid of this comfort zone. And go out and warn the people. Qum fa'andir. 
فكبر, and while you're doing this warning, then glorify your Lord. Praise Him. Worship Him. فكبر, فطهر, and your clothes, your garments, make sure that they are clean. There's a, again a lot of symbolism here. First and foremost, literally, make sure you have clean clothes. Don't have any najasa on them. Have a presentable appearance. All of this is literal. Then there's a sim- symbolism here that make sure that you have no sins to pollute you. Just like you're going to have clean clothes, make sure you have a pure soul, a good heart. And as for idols, get rid of them and leave them. Leave all idols. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that as you're preaching to the public, make sure that you are worshipping Allah, purifying yourself, and leaving all false idols. Uh, this is a complicated translation here. Manna uh, means to, to remind somebody of a favor they've done to you. This is what manna means, right? And Allah tells him, don't remind people of the favors that you've done because in order, if you, if you did this, what, why, would, why does somebody do this? You do it because you want to get the favor paid back. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? So when you give somebody a loan, then a few months later you say, Akhi, remember I gave you a loan, can I just borrow your car for a week? You know, you just remind him of the favor, right? And when you remind somebody of a favor, then you get that favor back somehow. So Allah is saying, when you do good, don't do it to get the favors back from people. Anything that you do, do it for the sake of Allah. Don't do it to get repaid back by the other people. And again, this goes back to the concept of sincerity. That when somebody does something purely for the sake of Allah, nobody can challenge that person's intention. But when somebody has other intentions, then it tarnishes that person's reputation. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ was not allowed to take zakat money. He was not allowed to take charity. He was not allowed to do anything uh, for, this, uh, for, for the sake of the religion and get money for that. He didn't do that. Because Allah Azzawajal told him, قُلْ لَا أَسَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مَالًا قُلْ لَا أَسَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا Tell the people, I'm not getting your money. I'm not getting your sustenance. So. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded him and of course Wali Rabbika Fasbir the last ayah to be revealed Wali Rabbika Fasbir and for the sake of your Lord be patient there is an indication that you're going to suffer calamities there's an indication that life is going to be difficult you're going to need patience and the only way you're going to be patient is by doing it for the sake of your Lord the only way you will be patient is if you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now this leads us to a little bit of a, a, a tangent here and it is a necessary tangent but it is a theological tangent of what exactly is wahi and how does wahi occur and what happens when a person is inspired wahi or inspiration is of course a direct communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind and Ibn al-Qayyim mentions that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was inspired by seven different means or methods or seven different ways because inspiration is not of one types. There's many different ways that the inspiration occurs. And the least of them, the lowest form of inspiration, is true dreams. And this is the only form of inspiration that is still open to mankind. All other types of inspiration have been cut off. The lowest form of inspiration is true dreams. And our Prophet would see dreams before becoming a prophet and after becoming a prophet. He could see true dreams before becoming a prophet because true dreams are not restricted to prophets. Anybody can get true dreams. The second type of inspiration is the whisperings of the angels other than the angel Jibreel. This is called Ilham. The whisperings of the angel. And an example of this is uh, the mother of Musa being inspired by Allah. This doesn't make her a prophet. This type of inspiration does not make you a prophet. The mother of Musa was inspired by Allah. Allah says in the Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ We inspired Ummi Musa. Does that make Ummi Musa a prophetess? No. Because this type of inspiration is different. And that is... Uh, we will never understand it, but this is something that is, happens to the extremely righteous people uh, that Allah chooses. Similarly, the uh, uh, mother of Isa, Allah mentions in the Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهَا That we inspired her, right? We told her that this type of inspiration 
It, is, it doesn't make you a prophet or a prophetess. And it comes from uh, 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 Allah through the angels, that the angels give you this type of message to the heart. The third type of uh, inspiration is to see the angel in front of you directly and to speak to the angel directly. And this is what happened with Iqra. It happened with Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir. It happened many, many times that Jibreel would come to the Prophet and speak to him directly. And usually when Jibreel would come to him, he would come to him in the form of a Sahabi by the name of Dihya Al-Kalbi. This was in Medina, not in Mecca. In Mecca, he would not take the form of Dihya. In, Ma- in Medina, he would take the form of Dihya because Dihya is an Ansari. Dihya was in Medina, not in Mecca. And he would take the form of Dihya. And Dihya was considered to be the most handsome of all of the Sahaba. He was considered to be the most handsome of all of the Sahaba. And therefore, Jibreel would just pretend to be in the form of Dihya. And then come, and people would see him and think he's Dihya, but he was not Dihya, he was Jibreel. And Aisha, on more than one occasion, saw the Prophet and talking to Dihya. And then she asked, what did Dihya want from you? And the Prophet said, that wasn't Dihya, that was Jibreel who had come to me. And the Prophet recognized him, uh, but other people would think that this is Dihya. This is the third type of Wahi. The fourth type of Wahi is that so the third type, the angel transforms to a human form. The angel becomes human-like. And the Prophet sees him, sometimes the Sahaba see him, sometimes they don't. Sometimes Jibreel will come and they couldn't see him. And sometimes he would come, as in the famous hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, right? When we were sitting with the Prophet that he was extremely white in his clothing, extremely black in his hair, and not a, sp- a spot of de- dust on him. And this turned out to be Jibreel. Usually when Jibreel will come, the Sahaba would be in the form of a man, the Sahaba would see him. But sometimes they would not uh, see him. This was easier for the Prophet ﷺ to bear. That when Jibreel became a human, or looked like a human, the Prophet ﷺ remained in his form. He remained how he was. And he could communicate directly with Jibreel. There was a more difficult inspiration, and that is number four now. Right? We're number four now. Number four, Jibreel would remain in his form. He wouldn't transfer into a human. And the Prophet would, something would happen to him. We don't know what, it's never gonna, we're never going to understand. But he would go into what we would call a trance. We would call it in English a trance. That he would lower his face, his eyes would close, and the world around him becomes unknown. Doesn't matter what's happening, he's in his own world. And that is the world of Wahi. And Jibreel is in his original form, meaning that the Prophet some something's happening to him to communicate with Jibreel. That he is getting some type of difference. Now what it is, we're never going to know. This is ilm al-ghayb. But he would go into this trance, and in this state, Aisha says, I have seen him on multiple times, that when the wahi was coming down on a cold day, he would break into a sweat. It's very difficult for him. And on another hadith, in another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, when Surah Al-Ma'idah came down, the Prophet ﷺ was on a camel. And Surah Al-Ma'idah was so heavy, the camel had to sit down. This is Surah Al-Ma'idah being revealed, right? The Sahaba cannot see anything. And camels can carry, mashallah, how many hundreds of pounds and kilograms. When Ma'idah came down, uh, the Prophet ﷺ on the camel, the camel had to sit down. Shows you how difficult. If this was the camel, imagine our Prophet ﷺ, as Allah says in the Quran, "Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila." We're going to give you a heavy speech, and this was the heavy speech. Also, it is narrated that once the Prophet ﷺ was on, was resting on the lap of one of the Sahaba, and he was wahi began, and the Sahaba felt a pressure and a pressure and a pressure and a pressure until he thought that his thigh bone would crack. Can you imagine the thigh bone cracking because of the pressure of the wahi? This shows us that this was a very difficult process for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hakim ibn Hizam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Hakim ibn Hizam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kayfa ya Rasulullah? How does wahi come to ya Rasulullah? So he told us numbers three and four, even though there's more than these. He says, sometimes Jibreel comes to me in the form of a man. And I understand what he says. And sometimes he communicates with me 
and I hear a noise like the ringing of a bell. It's very, he's comparing a noise, like the ringing of a bell. It's a very loud noise, it's difficult to bear. He's hearing something, this is a type of buzz, a type of noise, and this one is more difficult for me. That's what we just said now. That Jibreel doesn't become a man. Jibreel stays in his form of an angel, but the Prophet enters the world of Wahi, the world of ilm al ghayb whatever it is going to be. And he communicates with Jibreel in a manner. And in both of these, the Prophet said, and I understand what he tells me. The fifth type of Wahi uh, was when he saw Jibreel in Jibreel's original form. In other words, Jibreel manifested himself to the Prophet in his original form. And scholars have differed how many times this happened. For sure it happened twice. Once when Iqra was revealed, that was the original form. And once in the journey of Isra and Mi'raj. And some scholars add a third time. But these are the two that we know that Jibreel showed himself in his original form. What is his original form? All that we know is that he was so big he blocked the horizon. Couldn't see anything else. And he had 600 wings. 600. So that's the largest number of wings that the angels have. Because Jibreel is the most noble of all angels. So the Prophet saw Jibreel in Jibreel's original form. The sixth type of wahi, the sixth type of wahi is the wahi that... Uh, this is something that is disputed how and when it occurred. Uh, but Ibn al-Qayyim mentions it. Allah inspired him directly with, without the intermediary of the angels. Allah inspired him directly. Wahi. Without the intermediary of the angels. And this is something that Ibn al-Qayyim uh, mentions. And I don't have an example. I don't, I, I'm still wondering whether this one I would agree with or not. Allah knows best. But this Ibn al-Qayyim mentions. The seventh, so I'm quoting what Ibn al-Qayyim mentions. The seventh is the highest form of wahi possible. And that is... Allah's direct speech. Allah's direct speech bila wasita. Right? Number six is Allah's direct wahi. Number seven is Allah's direct kalam. Kalamullah. Kalamullah. And that happened once to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the journey of Al Isra wal Mi'raj. Only once did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak directly. Jibreel was not there. As we will discuss in a few weeks, inshallah, when we get there, even Jibreel said, you go on, Ya Muhammad, I cannot go. I don't have permission. I don't have the past to go beyond this. And so our Prophet went to a place where he could hear the scribes writing. And, كَادَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى And he was closer than two bows lengths. And uh, he could see the hijab of Allah Azza wa Jal. When he was asked, did you see your Lord? He said, I could I see him. There was a hijab of light. And he saw this light of the veil. And that was when Allah spoke to him directly. Like Allah spoke to Musa. However, our Prophet was preferred over Musa. And Musa is indeed worthy of preference and respect. But our Prophet was preferred over Musa. In that, Allah spoke to Musa on Turi Sayna. But Allah called our Prophet Muhammad to his presence in above the seven heavens. And so... Our Prophet reached a maqam that no other Prophet ever reached before. And of course, after him there is no Prophet. Now, some scholars claim that our Prophet وسلم, he became a Nabi through the revelation of Iqra. And he became a Rasul through the revelation of Ya Ayyul Muddathir Qum Fa'andir. That when Iqra Bismi Rabbi came down, that's when he became a Nabi. And then when Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir Qum Fa'andir was revealed, he became a Rasul. So this leads us to another tangent, which is again useful and interesting and we should know it. And that is, if that is the case, well then, what exactly is a Nabi? And what exactly is a Rasul? And what is the difference between a Nabi and a Rasul? And what was our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? There are many opinions about this issue. I will only mention to you four of them for the sake of brevity. Uh, the first of these opinions. One group of scholars said there is no difference between a Nabi and a Rasul. Nabi equals Rasul. And Rasul equals Nabi. They're synonyms. Just like Tawbah and Istighfar are synonyms. Just like Zakat and Sadaqa are synonyms. So Nabi and Rasul are synonyms. Every Nabi is a Rasul, every Rasul is a Nabi. 
This doesn't seem to be the strongest opinion because of many, many, many reasons. Of them is the verse in the Quran in which Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ We didn't send before you either a Rasul or a Nabi except that. Allah clearly says, مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِي And had they been the same thing, then this would be against the eloquence of the Arabic language to praise something like this. Had they been exactly the same, it doesn't make sense to put them together. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِي and there are other evidences that are given. So it doesn't seem to be a very strong opinion that Rasul and Nabi are the same. Another common opinion is that a Nabi is one who is inspired by Allah with a revelation, but he's not told to preach it to the people. Whereas a Rasul is somebody who is told to proclaim it to mankind. So a Nabi has a direct communication, but he doesn't preach. Whereas a Rasul has communication and he preaches. Now this is doubly problematic. This is problematic on multiple levels. Firstly, well, this very ayah that I just quoted, look at the Arabic. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِي أَرْسَلْنَا نَبِي So Nabis are also sent. Nabis are also sent by Allah. Because Allah says, أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِي And also our Prophet ﷺ in the hadith in Bukhari said, I saw all of the Prophets on the Day of Judgment. And, and Nabis. And there was a Nabi and he had a huge Ummah. And there was a Nabi and he had a small group. And there was a Nabi and he had five people. And there was a Nabi he had two people. And there was a Nabi and he had no people following him. What does this show? Nabis are also preaching to the people. And Nabis have, Anbiya have, Followings. Also, it doesn't make sense because the scholars are told that if you conceal knowledge, you're going to be punished. The scholars, in fact, the Muslim is told, بَلِّغُ anni walaw aya. So the average Muslim has to preach. How then can somebody be inspired by Allah and he just sits at home and does nothing? This doesn't make sense even logically, right? Even though this is a common opinion, many of you might have heard it. A Nabi is somebody who has wahi, but he doesn't preach. Whereas a Rasul is somebody who has wahi and he preaches. But it doesn't even make sense. La lughatan wa la aqlan wa la shara'an. It doesn't make sense. The third opinion is that a Rasul is someone who has been given a new sharia. And a Nabi is someone who follows the sharia of the Rasul before him. A Rasul is someone who has a new code of laws. Whereas a Nabi is somebody who follows the, the Sharia of the Rasul. So the Rasul comes with Sharia X. 50, 100 Nabi come, they all have Sharia X. Then a new Rasul comes with Sharia Y. Then another 20, 50, 100 Nabi comes, they follow Sharia Y. So this is an, a, another opinion. Well, this opinion would seem to be good except for the fact that it doesn't match up to all of the examples. It doesn't match up to the real life scenarios. Who can give me an ex uh, a case where it doesn't seem to fit? The raw data doesn't fit with the hypothesis. <laughs> Who? <laughs> uh, well, that, that, that doesn't negate the fact that he is Rasul and Nabi. Musa and Harun, what about him? Musa was the Rasul and Nabi and Harun was uh, Nabi. This was in Quran. Is that in the Quran? Yes. So, so the two, Musa was Rasul and Nabi, and Harun was Muslim. Was Harun only a Nabi or also a Rasul? Uh, this is something that scholars have, we mentioned this a few weeks ago in Ramadan, we were talking about this. Scholars have, some scholars have said that Harun was only a Nabi, and some have said that uh, he was a Rasul and a Nabi because of the other verse that we mentioned. Uh, what is it? Arsil Ma'iyya, not Arsil Ma'iyya, not Israel. The other, I'm not, it's not coming to me now, but the word Arsil is mentioned, right? Arsalna Ma'ahu Akhahu Harun, Arsalna Ma'ahu. Um, but there is an ikhtilaf. But, okay, this would in fact support the data. This would support the data. 
How about another example that doesn't support the data? Shu'aib and Salih. Yeah. Yusuf and his brothers. What about Yusuf? Yusuf is uh, not. By this definition, he wouldn't be a Rasul. But was he a Rasul? Yusuf was a Rasul. Yusuf was a Rasul. What's your evidence for this? No, he's not a Rasul. What's your evidence that Yusuf is a Rasul? He has a chapter named after him. <laughs> <laughs> Maryam has a chapter named after her and she's not a prophetess. <laughs> Question, were there women prophetesses? <laughs> Very easy for you to deny. <laughs> <laughs> Our sisters might disagree. <laughs> Our sisters, what do you say? <laughs> oh, mashallah, these are... <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you in many other gatherings I go to, uh, the sisters want there to be prophetesses, prophets of the female species, gender, excuse me, <coughs> not species. And um, they quote evidences. They quote evidences. We're going to a tangent from a tangent, but this is interesting. They quote evidences. Of their evidences is, of their evidences is, Jibreel alayhi salam come to Maryam. And Allah says, Wa and of their evidences is for Im Ummi Musa, because Allah uses the word Wahi for Im Ummi Musa. Right? And of their evidences is, Allah says in the Quran to Maryam, that Stafaituka, that Ala Nisa al Alameen, right? That I have chosen you above every single other lady. And so if Allah has chosen her to that level, then she's got to be not just a regular person, but a Nabi. And in fact, and in fact, a number of scholars of the Islamic tradition did argue that there were female prophetesses. Of them is Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, of them is Al Qurtubi, of them is Ibn Hazm al Andalusi. These people all believed that Allah sends men and women prophets. So, for those who want to preach this, they have some precedence. They're not coming out of the blue. Okay? Now, if somebody were to quote them an ayah in the Quran, which restricts prophethood to the male. What? What is the verse? What is the verse? Illa rijal and something. I like this. <laughs> I like this. The word rijal has got to be mentioned somewhere. Yes. <laughs> You're right, but what's the verse? <laughs> you just quoted the one word, <laughs> the man. <laughs> yes. What does that have to do with the prophethood? Right? Right? Allah mentions two conditions for prophethood. For every person that we sent before you was a man from the people of the town from the people of the cities. Allah never sent Bedouin prophets. Allah sent pe prophets of cultivations, of cities, right? Now, you quote this to Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, to Ibn Hazm. They will say, yes, we agree. Arsalna Rasul. And we are saying Maryam is a Nabi. Okay? So the ayah says we agree with it. Any other ayah comes to mind? You see, this is an interesting discussion here now. And it's very relevant to our times when a lot of debates are happening about... <laughs> so they quote the... So, of course, the number one example for a female prophetess is who? Maryam, correct? Right? So let us concentrate... I'm going into the tangent of a tangent, by the way, but I think everybody's interested in this, so we can afford the luxury here. And inshallah, we have plenty of time to, to have this here, inshallah, bi ta'ala. So a number of interesting points here. If Maryam is the, the example that they choose, let us see how Allah describes Maryam in the Qur'an. It is agreed that the angel showed himself to Maryam, correct? Does an angel showing yourself to a human make the human a prophet? What's your evidence? The Sahaba. the Sahaba. Exactly, right? Seeing an angel does not make you a prophet, or else Umar ibn Khattab would be a prophet. Aisha would be a prophet. Everybody would be a prophet, 
right? Seeing the angel Jibreel does not make you a prophet. And we already mentioned the types of wahi. And one of them, we said, ilham, which happens. And the angels coming, that's not necessarily the wahi of the prophets, right? I mean, do you have another example where an angel has come to another human being in the absence of a prophet? In the absence of a prophet? Yes, there are plenty of ahadith that uh, an angel uh, came to one of the people to test him, the, the bald man and the man who did the. There are plenty of traditions. The angel coming and talking to the people directly. Uh, there's an, even a uh, hadith in Bukhari that says a man was visiting his brother for the sake of Allah and he met an angel in the, in the guise of a man. And the angel spoke to him. Why are you going? What are you doing? What's your purpose? You're only doing this for Allah. Then I am the angel that Allah has sent to you to tell you that Allah loves you because you're visiting your brother. Right? So clearly there are angels that visit humans. Right? And this is not restricted, by the way, to the prophets. Even it could happen right now. You never know. There's no closure to this chapter. Right? You have something to add? Somebody has? Angel Jibreel is somebody without we don't know of Angel Jibreel coming to somebody in the previous generations. We don't know. But we know for a fact he came to people of this ummah. And people saw him and spoke with him. Right? Therefore, it's, uh, this is the first point. The second point, Allah mentions in Surah Al-Imran uh, about Maryam and, uh, Maryam and uh, Isa alayhim salam. What does Allah say? Hafizab, you need to help me out here. Um, the phrase is, uh, kana ta'am. Right? Uh, what is the phrase before it? This is the, the, the strength of Hivd when you can say what's before it. After it, I can do it. Right? <laughs> what's before that? Before this, Allah mentions that. Uh, Isa is just like a Rasul Qad Khalat Mi Qablihi Rusul. Right? Prophets have, Rusul have come before him. And as for his mother, his mother was a Siddiqa. Notice, Isa was a Rusul of the Rusul. And his mother was a Siddiqa. Clearly, Allah is mentioning their levels. And we know that of the levels, that أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ Right? These are the four levels. نَبِيِّين, صِدِّيقِين, شُهَدَاء, صَالِحِين So when Allah mentions Isa, He is of the Nabiyin and the Rusul. And then He mentions Maryam and He says وَأُمُّهُ صِدِّيقًا So clearly therefore, putting all the evidences together, the majority opinion has always been that the prophets of Allah have only been men. There is a minority opinion, and this is an opinion that does exist. Let us now get back. We're talking about these differences. Rasul and Nabi. And so we said a Rasul has the new Sharia, and Nabi has the same Sharia, right? I'm asking you, does this fit up with our raw data? And we were talking about this, about was Yusuf a Rasul or a Nabi? So let's get back over here. Was he a Rasul or a Nabi? Come on, guys, we gave a whole tafsir of Surah Yusuf. 16 halaqats. I think Yusuf was a Rasul. You all failed. <laughs> Quote me an ayah of the Quran. Yusuf is Ulul Azm? لا 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 Yusuf is not. Then he's a Nabi. You have something to add. He's a Rasul because. <laughs> First, you want only the prophets to be men only. Now, when you fail in answering the question, you say, Go ask the sisters. This is a contradiction in manhood. Yusuf did not have a risala when he came. But what is a risala? You're going, this is circular. This is, well, that's your definition of a rasul. This is a circular definition. You see the problem here. We're trying to define Risala and Nubuwa, and then based on that definition, you are classifying prophets, but what's the evidence? You, you see the problem here, right? It's a circular definition. Yusuf appears to have been a Rasul. That's not the ayah that I'm thinking of. 
حتى إذا هلك قلتم لن يبعث الله من بعده رسولا ولقد جاءكم يوسف من قبل بالبينات سورة غافر فما زلتم في شك مما جاءكم به حتى إذا هلك قلتم لن يبعث الله من بعده رسولا ولقد جاءكم يوسف رسولا This is in the Quran, Surah Ghafir, fourth page on the top, first eye on the right hand side. Clearly, Yusuf is mentioned as a Rasul, right? Therefore, this throws one spanner. Is there any other example? Come on, there's such an obvious example. Well, sisters, let's see. Such an obvious example that doesn't fit up with the raw data. Then the raw data doesn't fit up with this definition. Sisters. Adam. Okay, mashallah, you reclaimed some of your. Mashallah. <laughs> Adam, if a Nabi is someone who follows the Sharia ah of the previous prophets, was Adam a Rasul or a Nabi? Rasul. Rasul. Aha, so now we get into the whole issue then. What's your evidence he's a Rasul? If there's no Sharia before Adam, according to this definition, how can he be a Nabi? So you guys seeing, and, and you know, honestly, I, I ask this to some of the advanced students when I teach in Al Maghrib, and I do this uh, on purpose to demonstrate something. And that is, subhanAllah, these simple questions, we just gloss over them from Sunday school and we never think about them, right? Such a simple question, what is a Nabi and what is a Rasul? And wallahi, we think we know so much. And then, now when we get confronted with raw data, with Quran, this and that, even this begins to crumble and we realize how little we know, right? And that's why the scholars say, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Adam, Alhamdulillah. So far, I've been thinking all this time that uh, Yusuf was a Nabi. Yusuf was a Rasul. And Adam was a Nabi and not a Rasul. Hadith in, uh, hadith in uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed that Abu Dhar asked the Prophet uh, that, Ya Rasulullah, a Nabi and Kana Adam was Adam a Nabi? And the Prophet said, Naam, Mukallama. Yes, Allah spoke to him. In Jannah, Allah spoke to him. Naam, Mukallama. And Allah spoke to Adam. Wa ya Adam, muskun anta wa zawjukul Jannah. Right? And in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, Awwalu rasulin ursila ila al ard, Nuh alayhi salam. Awwalu rasulin. The first rasul is Nuh. So this is really, this is raw data now. The first rasul is Nuh. Adam is a Nabi. Right? And therefore, this doesn't add up now. That if the first Sharia is in this, it doesn't add up. And then, of course, there are other examples that just tell you you're getting already confused. Dawood and Sulaiman. How come the Greece was uh, has a Sharia? No, Idris is a Nabi. Well, who's the, who's the one who said, I'm not the one saying that? That's the point. You're defining it and then you're making it circular back. You see what I'm saying? No, I said this is the third opinion. Yeah, this is the third opinion. <laughs> it's getting too hot. People are getting <laughs> riled up. <laughs> yes, Idris was a Nabi, not a Rasul. Idris was a Nabi, and Idris was before Nuh. Idris was before Nuh, and Idris was a Nabi. He was not a Rasul. So this does not, that's what I'm saying, this third opinion does not make sense, right? And then the two other examples are, what did I just say? Dawood and Sulaiman. They were Rusul, even though the Sharia ah they followed was the Sharia ah of Musa. They were Rusul, and they had books given to them. Dawuda Zabura. But the Sharia ah they followed was the same. There was no change. The Zabur, even to this day, the Psalms of David, it's nothing but praise, singing, the tasbih and tahmid. There is no law at all in the Zabur. Because the Zabur was not meant to be a law. And therefore, a Rasul can even get a book 
But that doesn't mean that uh, it's going to have a new law. Right? And so all of this doesn't fit up with the raw data. The raw data doesn't match up with the hypothesis, so we have to go back to the drawing board, right? Instead of going on and on, there are other three or four opinions I'm not going to... But I just wanted to illustrate this point that subhanAllah, we need to learn our religion. We need to study. And um, personally, I find this the most fascinating subject is theology, aqidah. That's why I love to specialize in this. Uh, moving on now. So the, the correct opinion, inshallah. We'll give you the correct opinion. <laughs> you wanted the way correct opinion, okay. Uh, the correct opinion... Uh, seems to be the one that Ibn Taymiyyah uh, propounded. And of course, you know I'm a big fan of Ibn Taymiyyah. He's my mentor and my person I consider one of the greatest scholars of Islam. And you can see why. That when he discusses, he discusses with precision, with accuracy, with academic detail. Ibn Taymiyyah says, let's look at the linguistic meaning of Nabi and Rasul. Nabi comes from Naba'a. And Naba'a means information. Amma yitasa'aloon anin. Naba il Azim. And so a Nabi is somebody who informs you what Allah wants you to him to inform. So a Nabi has information from Allah. So a Nabi has to preach and a Nabi has to teach. By the word Nabi, Yunbi'u, he gives information anillah. Right? So the word Nabi automatically implies he's speaking to you a message from Allah. Okay? A Rasul comes from which means to send an emissary, a delegate, a representative, an ambassador. So a Rasul is somebody whom Allah sends. And you send a person, a Rasul, to a nation that generally you are not on friendly terms with. And so a Rasul is sent to a nation that does not believe in him. Whereas a Nabi teaches to a people that already accepts him. And if you look at this definition, all the raw data fits into place. All of it. Did any of Adam's children re reject him? No. Did any of Idris's people reject him? No. Aha, let's get to Nuh. <coughs> what happens? <coughs> people rejected him. People rejected him and he was sent to them. He was the Rasul Ursila ila ahl al ard. Right? Yusuf, now he becomes a Rasul and not a Nabi because he's sent to the people of Egypt. Right? Dawood and Sulaiman, they are sent to larger groups and they are fighting. They established a kingdom. One of the very few prophets who established a kingdom on earth. Right? Only the ones that we know, Dawood and Sulaiman and our Prophet Muhammad that we know, they established a kingdom on earth and a power on earth. And so they are Rasul. And look at the Anbiya. And the classic example is Isa and Yahya. Two cousins. Their mothers were sisters. Right? The one is a Rasul, the other is a Nabi. Why? What's the difference? They accepted Yahya, they rejected Isa. They accepted Yahya, they rejected Isa. So this definition seems to be precise. And then Ibn Taymiyyah says, generally, every Rasul does have a new Sharia, but this is not a rule. It's just a symptom which has exceptions. <laughs> it's an adjective. It's a description which is generally true. But it's not the rule. And there are exceptions. So every Rasul does not necessarily have a new Sharia, but generally, every Rasul did have a new Sharia. And uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Hadith is Muslim Ahmad. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "How many messengers did Allah send? How many Rasul?" And the Prophet sallallahu said, "310 and something." And this number is something that seems to have some type of power to it because that is the exact number of Badr, right? And it is also the exact number of of 310 and something. Huh? Well, of course, Rasul, yes. And it is also the exact number of the people of Talut who crossed over the river. When David and Goliath had the fight and Talut took his army, Right? The people who crossed over after that were around 310 and something. So this number 
some seems to be recurring in a number of times. So the Prophet said, how many Rasul? The Prophet said, 310 and something, a large quantity. Meaning don't trivialize, just because it's 310, don't think it's trivial. Their quality, their quantity is large, 310 and something. So he asked him, and how many Prophets were there? And so he said, 124,000. 124,000. This hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad and it is inshallah ta'ala hasan, authentic. And this is another indication that Rasul and Nabi are not the same. And from this we derive every Rasul is a Nabi but not every Nabi is a Rasul. Risala is higher. Risala is higher than Nabi. And every Nabi is a, every Rasul is a Nabi. Not every Nabi is a Rasul. And out of the Rasul there are the Ulul Azm who are five. Out of the Rasul there are the elites of them. Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. And these are, of course, the greatest ones that humanity has ever seen. And these are Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and our Prophet Muhammad. And uh, one more point before we move on, and that is that the concept of mankind having prophets is wallahi a concept that we need to really, I, I wish we had more time for this, but this is a seerah class. Of course it's relevant, that's why we're doing all of this, because what is our, what is the seerah? It's a discussion of the Rasul, the final Rasul, right? So all of this is a relevant tangent. But this tangent, wallahi, it's so important, maybe we'll do a, another class on it separately, and that is basically, why does mankind need prophets? What is the purpose of Allah sending prophets? And this is the crux of the difference between us and the rest of humanity. That we believe that the only guidance that is ultimate guidance is the guidance that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet. Whereas the rest of the bulk of the world believes that we will find our own way in life. And we will experiment with different laws and different customs and find what is best for us. Whereas we believe the best law is the law of Allah. And only Allah has the right to ultimately legislate, right? The ultimate legislation belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows what is best for us. We believe this as Muslims. And that is why Allah sends prophets continuously. To deny that Allah sends prophets is to deny the mercy and the power of Allah. I repeat, to deny Allah sends prophets. Because there are many people on earth who say, yeah, God created us, but then He let us be. You know, God created us, but then, you know, He has nothing to do with us anymore. And this is insulting to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Quran mentions this. What is the ayah? Surah Al-An'am. Uh, Surah Al-An'am, uh, verse 90, 91. Allah says, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ they did not, uh, this is very difficult, which means, I'll translate metaphorically, tafsir, this is not the exact translation. They did not give the respect that is due to Allah. When they said, Allah does not reveal anything to mankind. They insulted Allah by claiming that there is no revelation, there is no prophethood. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ for God so truly loved the world, we would say, like Christians say, for God so truly loved the world that He continued to send prophets to us from the beginning up until the very end. This is a sign of Allah's love for us. That there's always going to be prophets preaching the truth and without knowledge of the prophets, there is no ultimate knowledge of truth. How do we know what is right and wrong? How do we know what is haram and halal? How do we know what is illegal and legal, moral and immoral? unless they were prophets of Allah. And look around us, societies and nations, all of their laws differ. No two countries, in fact no two states within this country have the exact same laws. One thing might be legal in one land and illegal in another land, right? And logically, rationally, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if it's illegal in one land, why should it be legal in another? But this is the way, uh, you know, mankind is. That because when they don't have a standard, this is what's going to happen. For us, we have the ultimate standard. And that standard is the law of Allah, Azza wa Jal. Getting back to the seerah, inshallah, we have 10 minutes, so we'll just wrap up uh, this portion of it. And I think this was a necessary tangent about theology, and about sending prophets and the concept of uh, prophets. In this early time, when Qum Fa'andir was revealed, we only have a few brief stories of what the Prophet ﷺ would do. And that is that he would preach to his immediate friends and family. And we already mentioned that the first convert, really the first convert would have been his wife Khadija. Because she converted without even knowing what it was she converted to. 
And this shows her faith in her husband. That Allah is never going to humiliate you. Allah is never going to cause you to go astray. You are a person who is kind, who is merciful, who is tender. And so she converted without even knowing what it is she's converting to. That's the power of the strength that she had in her husband. And the second convert would have been Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Which a lot of people overlook. And a lot of people jump to the third. And that's Ali or Abu Bakr or whatnot. But Waraqa was a second convert. And he converted without even saying the shahada. Because there is no shahada to say at this point in time. Right? There is no shahada to say. But he converted by saying, you are a prophet. And that's conversion. Right? And he died without ever praying a prayer. Without ever. But because he had that sincerity. And he affirmed that this is a prophet of Allah. The prophet saw him in Jannah. The third convert. After all of this. People differ. Is it Ali or is it Abu Bakr or is it Zayd ibn Haditha. These three. Right? And... People have all three opinions, and one of the easiest ways to resolve this, they say, the first child to convert was Ali, and the first slave to convert was Zayd, and the first adult free man to convert was Abu Bakr. Right? It's an easy way out. All three are first. Right? Allah knows best who was the first, but all three are first. Right? This is the good way out. We give respect to all of them. Of course, as for Ali, there's no question that he was of the earliest of converts. Why? Because he's being raised by Khadija and the Prophet Muhammad right? In their household is Ali. And when they convert, obviously, Ali as well is going to convert. And at this time, he was probably around 10 years old. And we already mentioned that when the Prophet got married to Khadija, he offered uh, Abu Talib that I'll take care of your newborn. And that newborn was Ali. Right? I'll take care of a newborn because Abu Talib was a very poor man. Very poor man. And so he offered to raise him and feed him and whatnot. And therefore Ali was raised up in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then of course Abu Bakr and the conversion of Abu Bakr is well known. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu praised Abu Bakr like he praised no other companion. And he mentioned the conversion. We don't know an exact story. All we know is that when the Prophet presented Islam to him, he converted instantaneously. And this is mentioned in a hadith that the Prophet said in Medina, that once when the companions began to disagree amongst themselves, and a little bit of a uh, tussle happened, a verbal fight happened, uh, the Prophet said to Umar, he got a little bit uh, frustrated with something that Umar had done, and he said to Umar, that Allah sent me with the truth, but all of you accused me of being a liar. And it was only Abu Bakr who said, you are telling the truth. All of you accused me of being a liar, but it was only Abu Bakr who said, you are sadaqta, and he is a siddiq. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, there was not a single person whom I invited to Islam, except that he had some doubts before he converted. Thinking, should I or not? Except for Abu Bakr. For as soon as I presented, he did not hesitate and he accepted. And that is why by unanimous consensus of all Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Abu Bakr is the best of all companions. And anybody who curses Abu Bakr, may Allah's curse be upon that person. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has chosen me as a Khalil. So I cannot choose a Khalil. What is a Khalil? A Khalil is a sincere friend. A friend that is the highest level. And you can only have one Khalil. So the Prophet said, Allah has chosen me as a Khalil. So I cannot have any other Khalil. But were I to choose a Khalil, it would have been Abu Bakr. This hadith is in Bukhari. Were I to choose a Khalil, it would have been Abu Bakr. And we already mentioned that the only Sahabi who is mentioned by name in the Quran is of course Zayd. Right? And that is a great honor. No question about it. The only other Sahabi who is directly referenced is Abu Bakr. Right? In which ayah? Thani athnaini idhuma fil ghari. Allah calls Abu Bakr Thani athnain. And Allah mentions the pronoun, idhuma, when the two of them are in the cave. So the only other companion that is directly by pronoun, not by name. By name it's only Zayd. But directly mentioned, Allah praises him, the second of the two. The first of them being Rasulullah. So Allah called him the second of the two. And that is enough of an indication of his rank in this ummah. He is second to none other than Muhammad Wallahi, Wallah, what more do you need? What more do you need? Right? Thani Allah calls him in the Quran. 
And therefore, we have no problem saying that anybody who does not consider Abu Bakr to be a Muslim, that person is not a Muslim. Well, I have no problem saying this. Because Allah calls him in the Quran, Thani Athnain. And the Prophet praised him to such a level that it is simply not possible for a believer in Allah and his messenger to disbelieve in the status of Abu Bakr. And this is my opinion that I will defend uh, very staunchly. Uh, nonetheless, this is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. We say he is number... Uh, depending on how you want to put it, but he's number one of the adult males, right? Uh, the convert after Abu Bakr is Zayd. And we mentioned Zayd's story and how the Prophet adopted him, and at this time he's called Zayd ibn Muhammad, and then many years later in Medina he's called Zayd ibn Haritha, so much so that Ibn Abbas said, I never knew that Zayd was anybody other than Zayd ibn Muhammad until Allah revealed, uh, you know, Surah, uh, Surah Al Ahzab, that he's being raised thinking that Zayd is Zayd ibn Muhammad, and that is Zayd ibn Haritha. And these converts were directly from the Prophet, directly. The next batch of converts all converted from the hands of Abu Bakr. And this shows us how Allah helped the Prophet by Abu Bakr. The next batch of converts, the f next four converts, all of them are at the hands of Abu Bakr. Number one amongst them, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Number two, Uthman ibn Affan. Number three, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. Number four, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. These are the next four converts in Islam. I repeat, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Uthman ibn Affan, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. And all of these four are of the earliest converts to Islam. They are all converts at the hand of Abu Bakr. That as soon as the Prophet approached Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr converted, Abu Bakr then went to his immediate circle of friends and spoke to the people that he knew. And all of them converted uh, within the next few weeks uh, of this uh, incident, of, this, of the preaching of the Prophet of Abu Bakr. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was the youngest of them. And he was a young boy, probably around 16 years old when he converted. And uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was from a, a great family of the Quraysh. His mother, when she, when she left idolatry, his mother threatened him, tried to torture him, and then she used emotional blackmail. And she said, I am going to stop eating and drinking until you worship idols. And I will die a painful death in front of you, the emotional blackmail, until you leave your faith. He tried to convince her, he tried to cajole her, he tried to, but she withered away. She was, uh, you know, sickening and weakening and, 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 and uh, on her basically deathbed until Sa'ad became very uh, emotional and, and riled up. And he said to his mother, Wallahi ya ummati, or I swear by Allah, O my mother, that I'm not going to give this religion up no matter what you do. And if I had 100 ruhs in me and I had to give up every ruh and see you die in every single one of them then I will still not go back to worshipping idols I can't do this and so when his mother saw that determination then she broke her fast and she started eating and in response to this Allah revealed in the Quran وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا if they force you to try to worship idols, don't listen to them, but be good to them in this world. Don't be harsh to them. Be good to them in this world. This came down as a result of Sa'd ibn Abi uh, Waqqas. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is that person whom, uh, the, he was the first person to ever throw a bow and arrow for the sake of Islam. The very first person. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is the only person that the Prophet ﷺ said to him, that may my mother and father be given for you in ransom. Now this was an expression in Arabic. May my mother and father be given for you in ransom. Uh, it's an expression in Arabic which basically means I would give up everything for you. That's what it means. And the Prophet ﷺ never said this to anybody except for Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. And he said to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. And that is a huge honor that the Prophet ﷺ is saying to Sa'd ibn Abi uh, Waqqas. And of course, Sa'd was one of those who was chosen in the Shura when Uthman was killed, he was assassinated. Uthman is on his, uh, sorry, not Uthman, Umar. Umar is on his deathbed. Umar says, I will choose the only people left alive whom I am sure that the Prophet ﷺ was well pleased with when he died. And he chose number one amongst them, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Number one amongst them, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. This is Sa'd. Uh, Uthman ibn Affan, you don't need to know the blessings of. More and more we have said enough of Uthman ibn Affan and we'll get more to him more and more. And of course, Uthman was one of those in the Shura of Umar. Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, 
was the uh, third convert of Abu Bakr. Zubayr ibn Awam is a direct cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Like Ali, he's a cousin, except not through the uncle, but through the aunt. So Zubayr is also a cousin of Ali, and he's a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. His mother is Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib. His mother is Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib. And Zubayr ibn Awam is a Sahabi, the son of a Sahabiyya, the father of a Sahabi, because his son is Abdullah ibn Zubayr, the brother of a Sahabi. He is of the most noble of all uh, Sahaba in this sense. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, every single Prophet has been given a special protector or friend, I should say, Hawari, so disciple. Every Prophet has been given a special uh, disciple, and Allah has given me as my Hawari, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. This is Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. And the, uh, the other person, Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, as you all know to be the, 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 the businessman, the trader, right? Abdurrahman ibn Awf was the eldest of these converts after Abu Bakr. He was in his 30s. He was already an, 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 a, a young man. And he was very wise in business, even at this stage. And he was very honest in his dealings. And... When Abu Bakr approached him with Islam, he accepted Islam. Abdurrahman ibn Awf is the famous one who when he left Mecca, he had to give up all of his belongings to the Quraysh. He came a beggar, only having the clothes on his back. right? And the Ansari said to him, that famous statement, the Ansari said to him uh, that I have two gardens, I'll give one to you. I have two wives, I'll divorce one, give one to you. I have two stories in my house, choose one. And this is the famous Abdurrahman ibn Awf. He didn't even have a single thing except the clothes on his back and he said may Allah bless you just tell me where is the marketplace and let me just go and start selling things he took some butter that was his food for the day he took that and he started selling this and that this and that until finally he came with some gold and he got married and he's got perfume he's wearing his garment and he became a rich businessman as you know this is Abdurrahman ibn Auf the famous Abdurrahman ibn Auf who lived a very noble and a very uh, beautiful life after that uh, the next companion who converted was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And the story of his conversion involves both Abu Bakr and, and the Prophet ﷺ together. Ibn Mas'ud. Now all of these converts, by the way, that we mentioned were noblemen. They're all from the Quraysh. And all of them were to have very prominent lives in Islam. And we as Muslims should really know these names by heart. And we should know their stories and know the differences between them. Right? These are people, subhanAllah, one point brothers and sisters, every one of these early converts became a legend. And why not? Because it shows they converted early. Right? Every one of these early converts is a mountain in and of himself. He's an ummah in and of himself. And his stories and his legend. And of course it is expected that these people who converted at that stage, they would become the best of the best. And the next major convert that we'll discuss is Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud was the, one of the first to convert who was not of the noblemen of the Quraysh. But he was not of the slaves. He was a servant class. right? So he's not a slave. But he was not of the noblemen of the Quraysh. He was of the, the Yemeni tribes. And he worked as a servant. So he was not lowly, but he was not noble. He was not of the noblemen. He was not of the elite. He was in the middle. And Ibn Mas'ud was hired to be a shepherd for Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it, that enemy of Islam. And the Prophet in Abu Bakr, he tells us his story, Ibn Mas'ud. And he says, one day I was with my flock and I saw two men come in the distance and I didn't recognize them. He didn't know who they were. Because he's a servant, he's not paying attention to the people of Mecca. And so uh, the two of them come and say, uh, oh young man, and he was a young man at the time. Oh, young man, we are thirsty. Can you give us some milk? He has plenty of sheep. Give us some milk. So Ibn Mas'ud says, and this shows his honesty. He says, I'm afraid I can't because these don't belong to me. I don't own them. That It's my right to give you their milk. Uh, they belong to somebody else. And so it's not my right. And this shows his honesty that he's being so precise that I can't give you. It's not mine to give. I wish I could, but I can't. So the Prophet ﷺ said, very well. Show us one of the, uh, the, the she-goats that has stopped giving milk. Elderly she-goat that doesn't give any milk anymore. Show us which one is that. So he said that one now is beyond the age of milk. So the Prophet ﷺ got this, uh, or Abu Bakr got it for him. And he made dua and he rubbed the udder of the goat. And lo and behold it became full in front of the eyes of Ibn Mas'ud. And they milked it right then and there. And they drank it. Now this is the milk that is coming from a cow. They, they don't, this is not from any, it's a miracle from Allah. 
right? They said, we don't need your permission. You're not the one that this milk does not come except from the blessings of Allah. So they milked this and they drank it. And Ibn Mas'ud is just astonished because he's seeing a miracle with his own eyes. And he asks, who are you? And he is told that this is Abu Bakr and this is Muhammad, the, the Prophet Wasallam. And so he converts right then and there. And he became the sixth convert to Islam. Ibn Mas'ud uh, was the one whom the Prophet ﷺ said, if you want to know how to read the Qur'an, read the Qur'an the way Ibn Mas'ud does. This is Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud is the one who said that, I learned more than 70 surahs, that is two-thirds of the Qur'an. I learned more, because 70 surahs is the bulk of the Qur'an, I learned more than 70 surahs directly from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. I don't need you to teach me. I learned the Qur'an directly from the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And then after this, and with this we will conclude inshaAllah, the next batch of converts was a lot of the slave class. Those who were not the freemen of Mecca. And a lot of people converted. Most famous amongst them is of course Bilal, uh, Ibn Abi Rabah and Khabbab Ibn al Arat and uh, Yasir and his wife Sumayya and their son Ammar uh, and many other stories. So, all of these converts they began to convert after these elite noblemen of the Quraysh and Ibn Mas'ud had converted. One final story, inshallah, I just need to conclude with this and then we'll move on next time. A very interesting story of a Yemeni by the name of Amr ibn Abasa. Very interesting story. Very interesting. And it shows us a lot about early Islam. And it shows us a lot about the Prophet Amr ibn Abasa tells us in the first person, he's narrating his own story, that in the days of Jahiliyyah, I knew that idol worshipping was wrong. And I knew that my nation was upon misguidance. And I didn't do this. So, news came to me that somebody in Mecca was preaching something like I was saying. That idolatry is wrong. News reached me in Mecca that somebody is saying something like this. So I traveled all the way from Yemen to Mecca. And I found out who is this man. And I found him Mukhtafi. This is very important. Next week we're going to come back to this. Mukhtafi means that he was not public. He was hiding. I found him Mukhtafi. He was hiding. And I asked him, who are you? He says, I was gentle, I talatoftu ma'ahu, I was nice to him, I kept on talking. And then I asked him, who are you? What are you? Ma anta, not who are you, but what are you? So the Prophet said, Ana Nabi. I am a prophet. So he said, what is a Nabi? By the way, this shows us the Prophet saying he's a Nabi, because every Rasul is a Nabi. Right? So I'm a Nabi. What? So he says, what is a prophet? And the, pro the Prophet said, a prophet is someone whom Allah has sent. Arsalani Allah. So Nabi Arsal, we said. So he is a Rasul, he is a Nabi. I am somebody whom Allah has sent to mankind. So he asks, with what? What has he sent you with? So the Prophet ﷺ said, to fulfill the ties of kinship, to be good to the family, and to break all idols, and that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be worshipped. This is my message. Notice, no salah, no zakah, no hajj. It's just... Be good to one another and worship Allah alone. This is the basics of Islam, right? This is the basic message of Islam. So, Amr said, who has followed you? Who are your followers? He said, one free man and one slave. Now, there were more than this, but it's showing us this is early Islam. Abu Bakr and Bilal. These are my two main followers. One free man and one slave. So, Amr says, I want to be your follower. Now, Amr is the first non makki person to come and say he wants to convert. In this early era, the Prophet ﷺ says, you cannot do this now. He rejects the conversion of Amr. You cannot do this. We're going to come back to this point next week. He rejects the conversion of Amr. You cannot do this now. Don't you see my situation? I have to hide from my own people. You're not able to. You're not a Qurashi. You're going to be killed. You can't do this now. Right now I'm preaching, this was the early da'wah, we're going to come to this. The early da'wah, he's only preaching to وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ He's only preaching to his own kith and kin, his own people. So he says, you cannot do this now. Go back to your people. Now listen, this is the phrase, is really interesting. Go back to your people. And when you hear that I have been victorious over my people, then come back to me. SubhanAllah, this is the first year of the da'wah. 
And he already knows that Allah is going to help him out. When you hear that I have been victorious, then come to me. And Amr says, I went back to Yemen waiting and knowing that eventually his da'wah would be supreme because I knew that this is a prophet. And when I heard that the Prophet had immigrated to Medina, I went all the way back to Medina. And I entered the masjid of the Prophet and I said, Ya Rasulullah, hal araftani, do you recognize me? SubhanAllah, it's been how many years now? At least 15 years. At least 15 years since this initial incident has happened. Right? And the Prophet looked at him and said, Yes, you are the man who came to me from Yemen in Mecca. SubhanAllah. He doesn't remember the name, but yes, you're the one who came to me. Right? And so that's when he accepted Islam and he became one of the uh, muhajirun, uh, one of the uh, immigrants to Mecca. And this we will talk about inshallah to derive some of the points of wisdom and benefit and the issue of the secret da'wah. And I will mention next week there's no such thing as a secret da'wah. We don't use this term at all. It is rather a private da'wah or a closed da'wah. And why was it private and why was it closed and what happened? Inshallah ta'ala that will be next Wednesday with ta'ala. And with that we uh, conclude this halaqa and ask somebody to make the adhan.